Uh, hi, again, we're continuing. This is the eighth session, eight week. I need to remind people of what we talked about last week. That is, uh, I still have to think about whether the exam is going to be on the 20th or 27th. I have to talk to, I have to talk to, you know, upstairs to see what's going on. I haven't heard about any exams on the, those two days. Uh, I, I have to go check what the, there's going to be an exam that day or not. There might be what? We already have. Which one? Twentieth. Twentieth. Not twenty-seventh. Twentieth. That means I'll probably have to hold out on the twenty-seventh then. So if you have an exam on the twentieth, twenty-seventh, um, what time is the twentieth exam? Is it the morning or is it the afternoon? Because the rule is I have to cannot have it like an hour or two hours before, either before or after one of them. So if I, uh, uh, but I can, I'd rather go on the 27th anyways, give you more time to study. But students complain saying, I want to go on my vacation earlier, right? Really, you shouldn't plan vacations until the end of the exam session, really. Uh, but I understand. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tentatively, um, I'll tentatively suggest the 27th. Remember, we're having a double session on uh, May 23rd. The 23rd of May, we'll have a double session on the 23rd of May. Uh, uh, we'll finish at, uh, uh, like, probably, like, 4.30. So, therefore, the class right after this. Um, if, you have, if you have another class, okay, just tell me to sign the attendance sheet and go to your class. Uh, I don't think I'm going to give an extra quiz on that day per se. <laughs> um, it, it's going to be, it's, what I'm doing is I'm moving the 12th session to, the, I'm, I'm combining, uh, um, I'm holding the 12th session on the, on the, on the 23rd rather than the 30th. Because why? Because the third, if, if, if we didn't have 30 as a vacation day, right? 30th as a vacation day, because it's Christ, uh, 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 Corpus Christi, I would be having, I would have no problem. There would be no need for makeup. Uh, but because of that holiday, I have a makeup session because of uh, to next week's, like you're not going to have a class next week. Okay. Okay, we're fighting. Can you shut the door? I, I don't like shutting the door, but they're getting louder. You notice that? They're getting louder up there. So we, so we don't have the class next week. No class next week. No class, okay. Because I'm going to be in, I'm going to be coming back on an airplane uh, uh, from Budapest, okay. and therefore there's no way I, 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 maybe I could get to the classroom, but I'll be, uh, I will be in a very, you know, I don't know about you, but we're having to wake up and be on a plane at four in the morning or uh, uh, three, uh, four or five in the morning to get here to Warsaw at three and no sleep at all. Uh, I, I don't think I'll be any condition to, uh, uh, even though technically I could probably be here, but uh, trust me, uh, I'll be exhausted from the, the, the conference the day, the day, even though I love it. This is the problem. The university says, go take a cheap, cheaper airline for budgetary reasons. Take the cheaper airline. So I took the cheaper airline, and uh, now I'm regretting it. I wish I didn't take the cheaper airline. You were here already, right? You just went. To, you just left a second ago, right? Okay, okay. I just want to make sure I don't have to ask you to sign a sheet, right? And everyone is no, no one is everyone signed the attendance sheet, so we have that. So I'll correct myself and just say that double session on the double session will be on uh, 23rd. It will focus on the tools. So we'll have, we, we have two, uh, there's two classes scheduled for the Tools of Politics. Um, the readings from the Tools of Politics is mostly from uh, Lords from Chapter 12 to Chapter 20, including some parts from The Prince and some parts from uh, the, the book on Weber's on bureaucracy. Okay, so therefore that the, uh, uh, those are the primary reading assignments for those sessions. So therefore, if uh, uh, and we'll go over those. Today's topic, uh, today is the eighth session. This is the classical form of regime. The, the primary reading was from the Aristotle's politics uh, uh, reading, uh, transla uh, the translation of the politics, uh, particularly books four and six, which talked about the variations of regime. 
And why I'm going over that is because even though the modern regime struck, the thing about the even modern regime types was that what it did was it, the classical form of regimes, ten, modern form of regimes, tended to be just typologies, right? And really didn't give us a, now maybe Tilly's, Tilly's and, if we turn to like Tilly's and, and um, Dahl's models of regime, the four, the two, in other words, you have the, the two criteria of democracy versus capacity. You could then, therefore, you could, you could therefore measure regimes. You could measure regime change. You could measure it, but, uh, but, but within type only, okay? You could only measure it within type. You couldn't really measure it Within scope of scope of variation and how it changes. You know, in other words, you, you can maybe you can get the idea of that. You get okay, we see this, but we don't see the deep workings. We can see the pro we maybe measure or change the process, the move of a thing, by measuring cate using categories of inclusivity and incl uh, for you know what is it. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, doll is again include yeah, competitiveness, inclusivity, um, and then you the, you measure the inclusivity of the regime or the structure, the particular government, how it changes. If there's a change, you can therefore graph out this. The same thing. T this is something Tilly does with this capacity versus democracy criteria. Now, but the problem with this is that the um, the modern state theories just tend to end up becoming defining categories. Okay defining categories. And also because the nature of the modern state theory tends to see the political structure of the system as a homogeneous representative, representation of a homogeneous whole. Okay? In other words, gov you know, in other words, government is merely the government structures, the administrative structures are administrative agents. And that citizens are, you know, it, it doesn't really have a good... State the, mod, the modern model of the state, the concept of the state, really doesn't have a useful mechanism to explain contestation, uh, political contestation, conflicts of interests, com the competition of various interests. Actually, what they it, it, it sees such conflicts as only pathological. Okay. It, it would only understood that ultimately as pathological, and that therefore, in other words, the, 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 the idea is that once you had a, once you had a unified general will, any any willing that was contrary to the general will would be, uh, um, uh, uh, per, you know, destructive to the ends of the body politic. So therefore, um, it, it's not. Therefore, the argument is that this was this this leads to a problem in understanding political behavior. Okay, because if we look at if we take a commonsensical look at how people and uh, uh, political uh, people in societies and modern states do actually behave, we see there's much competition of interest, right? So therefore, what ends up happening is often you know, one of the greatest problems in political science was when the behavioral revolution in the 19 Hundred, uh, basically 1940s, 50s, and achieved this domination in American political th political science in the 1940s and 50s, and uh, and only had this kind of like breakdown in the late 60s, late 60s, early 70s, um, was the rejection of the political regime or the, the you know the, the the state, both the state, in other words. What it looked rather was at the systemic process of conflicting interests, groups, uh, and therefore understood behavior individually. Therefore, either you got behaviorist models or very much econometrics model, okay, like public choice theory, public interest theory, and these. These were these were the things that emerged. It was uh, first there was the kind of behavioral theory of the 1940s and 50s, and then starting in the 60s. Uh, 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 50s, 60s, and 70s, you had the econometrics model, the econometrics criticism of behavioralism. Okay, so that was kind of like the fight that was going on in, let's say, American political science. Now, over here, you were all Marxists or denial Marxists. 
In other words, you didn't have really political science. What you had was journalism. Uh, 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 in fact, political science departments in Europe, particularly Central Europe, tended to emerge out of a, a reaction against sociology. Um, and the perception that just, I mean, Warsaw University itself, the political science department was a reaction against basically sociology, but also the Jewish centric character of the sociology department. It was, it was created in 1968 during the uh, two things, the anti-Stalinistic and anti-Semitic moment. Because you have to understand that Stalin and the Stalinists used Jews as a mechanism of state oppression in countries like Eastern Europe, a lot of the uh, satellite countries. They used Jewish political actors, people, who, political actors who were of Jewish ethnicity, even if they weren't practicing Jews, but were ethnically Jews, and they used them as a mechanism to oppress the majority. Because why? They couldn't challenge the authority of the party, because they couldn't appeal to the people, and, and, and uh, uh, therefore they were not, had no ability to react against the party leadership. So when there were the, uh, the anti-Stalinist moment happened in the late 60s, there was a reaction to all the instruments of Stalinism, including party control, security control, the security services, and the, in, the individuals and the groups that had a, a significant part. And therefore that explains that. So therefore um, we have to always understand that uh, Euro the Central European approach to political science really was simply just journalism. Okay, it was kind of more journalistic. It was it was a rejection of the sociological tradition of this Poland, and Poland had a very strong positivist sociology tradition. Um, uh, the school of sociology was very much influenced by the French and German schools of sociology, and that therefore it was it was very powerful. It resisted Marxist reductionism. It it, it made accommodations with it, but it still resisted. So that's why, Paul, and like, and same thing with the um, the, the, the so-called Lvov School of History. So you had this, you had these certain institutions that made it. You had uh, also the Lvov School of Philosophy too, the analytical philosophy, the in philosophy, Lvov analytical approach to philosophy, which was Austrian. It, it was based on out of Vienna. It was very logical positivist. Was so logic centered and analytical that it was able to. It was a, a, able to ignore, ignore, uh, uh, I hate this, I put my silent phone on. People call and I tell them, don't call. Uh -huh. You know, I tell people my schedule, say, don't call this time, and they call this time. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so therefore, to understand what's going on, so when I'm talking about American, so we have to understand behavioralism in terms as an American philosophy. It's, it, it's an American approach to political behavior. This was the dominant approach in American political social sciences up until the late, up in the political sciences up to the late 60s. And then what happened with then was you had what we call the post-structuralist rebellion. In political science, the rebellion happened because of uh, Vietnam and the role that positive behavioral philosophy had in shaping American Vietnam policy and the reaction of the, the protests against student protests and then academic protests against collaboration or participation, universities' participation in the Vietnam War. Okay, And what happened was this was therefore the rise of postmodern, post-structuralist approaches in sociology and political science, no. There was kind of an anthropological moment where the anthropologists tried to influence the thing, but the dominant, uh, the new, uh, uh, what replaced in a most scale American political uh, science, what would eventually replace behavioralism will be game theory. By the 1980s and 1990s, game theory will have, for, for the most part, uh, either game theory, collective choice, or approach models will will become the dominant approach in uh, American political science in that sense. But in your Europe, after this, what ends up happening is you have a kind of free fall. Uh, uh, so therefore, this is why, why am I explaining this? Well, one of the things that happened in the 1980s 
part of, um, it, uh, you know, starting in the 1990s, sorry, late 80s, 1990s, there was the return of the state moment, led by sociologists, led by political scientists and, uh, and also politic sociologists who studied political sociology. They brought back the state as a model. Behavioralism had no role for the state. So therefore, but the problem with the state was always the problem of, of how do we understand the nature of a homogeneous system? If the logic of the modern state is homogeneous by its fundamental character, how do you explain and its, and its impulse structure and its explanation of how it forms itself? How then you explain at a, a group, group differentiation and group politics? and conflict with it inside a, a, a little political contestation for interests and groups. Usually what ended up happening was economics models approaches, economic approaches like game theory and interest group or collective choice models became the dominant kind of action, explanation of this. But these tended to be behavioral and not institutional. And that therefore there was a need for a, a model that there was they, the, the recovery of the state as an institutional approach was problematic because the logic of the state did not allow the kind of behavioral, a kind of contestation behavioral model that wanted. And that's why people like Tilly, Tilly and Dahl will try to do this with their approaches and their regime models, but it fails. Now, I are, one of the things I argue is that well, let's return to the classics. The classics actually, the classical conception of regime or the politeia was a much more effective model because it was flexible, because it did not assume a unitary structure, but rather it, uh, it saw that, that the political actor was always, the regime was always formed by a conception of thing. So let's go return to the, you know, the, that, that, that first slide from two weeks, last week and the week before a little bit, that the idea of the terms of what it was, right? That it merged as the concept of the constitution or political form, the system of structure, this is what the regime is. We talk about the regime. The classical regime model understood itself in terms of this. Again, let's repeat the famous climate that deals with, again, what does it always deal with? It deals with, like, like, the, like the definition of the Constitution, the functions of government, the structure of government, and the procedures of government. So what is the government? The government are the specific institutions, the specific public institutions recognized, in other words, that, that are kind of the recognized ruling, exercising collective authority. Now, we will understand the modern model of state government is that government is, a repre is representative of the whole. The classical model is, well, ye yes and no. It, in other words, the government is not, government is exercising the collective power. It's exercising on behalf of the collective entity. But it's often, its origin is often by the strongest group in the society or the community. It is the group that has the, the most ability, the most influence, the most power, and it has the ability, uh, it, it's advocating on behalf of the whole. And therefore, the question then becomes, well, are, are they in, uh, are the actions of that group really benefiting everyone or is it not? And therefore you can measure every group's claim to the degree that its policies are, act, are actually benefiting the group. Now, it doesn't have to be perfectly, but it has to be to, to, to a great, good degree that the policies and actions of the ruling, ruling, the ruling government has to deliver benefit and goods Good, the goods, hence this is what common good mean. Common good does not mean some kind of transcendent virtue. The common good is the shared benefit that everyone gets. The common, what you share. The necessary things that everyone benefits from. So things like roads, things like structures, schools, organizations that are, and who's paying for it or who's doing it, it's done through, 
It's, 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 it's being exercised and paid for by all. Usually paid, taken money taken from the government or the ruling part, tax collects money by coercion. Uh, it, it will, it will, it will ask, but then will it, when, when and, and people will normally give when they want to, when they perceive it, it's in their interest. But they will also demand those who don't pay, those who kind of refuse or won't pay, are co are forced to pay. In other words, if you don't want to pay, sorry, you have to pay. So let's go to this problem. Now, this return goes us to the question that it was the governing order, the structure, the modern, it, it, it's contrary to the modern, the modern idea understands it as a centralized structure. Here we understand it as a discrete structure of discrete parts, the classical model. And therefore we pay attention to the parts within a community or society. And this is the problem. I'm gonna be, we're gonna be a little bit sloppy here because the terms, I'm, I'm being a little sloppy here because the, the concept of what community is and what society is. Community is a small, a society is a much larger structure than, it's a, in other words, community is a smaller structure. It's a more intimate structure. It is always, community is always understood in terms of people sharing a life together sharing a life together. It's a much smaller and more intimate community. Much smaller and more intimate network of families, households. It's localized. Societies are larger networks. Sometimes even larger networks uh, based upon shared interest and shared utility. The, and one does not necessarily have to live or have much in common with those that one is engaged in society is. In other words, therefore, community requires a, 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 a shared life together, a shared common life together. Society doesn't. So therefore, society can be a much larger structure. And because it's dependent, on, uh, it's dependent upon structures of shared interest, this is why the division, of, the division of labor and shared interests are a very important structure of explaining why it happens. So therefore, the classical model would understand this as therefore the parts. Now we have the famous, the first, you know, what is the first division of parts? And that is we divide, how would we divide people into groups? Demographics, you know, this is in political science and social science and humanities, we look at demographics. What are demographics? These are the mechanisms of definitions of by which group individuals or group people form themselves into groups. One of the, two of the classic mechanisms of this is ethnicity, uh, ethnicity, which includes race, race, ethnicity, and class, which is what? Class is a more broader concept. Class involves economic, it, it involves, I mean, the social sciences, we use a term called SES, social economic status, right? Which also include uh, e, not only economic, but education. So therefore, economic status was also defined, therefore, about your wealth, of how much money you have, but also what? In terms of your education your social status. Your social status is not only that, but also whether you come from a family that is long established versus brand new, or people who have not had established families. In other words, is your family long known or is it not? Is it old or new? And are you wealthy or poor? Or the word is middling, the middling sort is the misos, those who have enough. They don't, they're not lacking. Poor, remember, this is the irony of uh, the language of the poor. The word poor, upus, no, sorry, a prior, a prios. A prior is the Greek word for means, uh, the priori, the means, or uh, prios would be, the, uh, uh, or the pria even, the means, the, the things that you're able to survive. It's like the economic term we'd use would be called capital, right? We'd say today in economics, you'd call it capital, right? These are the means to sustain yourself, to live. 
in order to live? How are you able to do it? How much means? These are your goods, your resources. And the poor are a priori, prios, that is without, without. And the wealthy are ooh, you, ooh, what it means, it's, it means well, lots, lots, right? So that's the first conception of here. Um, here is the famous chart Aristotle gives us about using, um, uh, this is from chapter three, again, this is from uh, the account of chapter three, the initial account, and then uh, uh, later in that same paragraph, there's an extended account, and there's a little te typo arrow, one, two, three, that's, oops, there's a, you know, uh, um, uh, how can I say this, the gra that word made a goof. <laughs> um, here is the, the, the initial thing is the well-off, the poor, the middling sort, and then he mentions the armed and the unarmed. Then the next thing is the one is divided between the poors, the notables, and then a discussion of the middling sort is omitted at this point. He, he, ha, he, he talks about it, he talked about it here, but then at the later part of that same chapter, chapter three, book four, he doesn't really kind of, he's, I'm compa comparing with how he elaborates in the rest of the chapter, but the next part of the chapter, this next paragraph, okay, he elaborates on it. He says the poor, well, they're the farmers, the commercialing, and the workings. And he, he, does, he, he does not distinguish between art, artisans or craftsmen and body laborers. And here, the notables, the word notables, he picks the word notables. And what do we mean by notables? This is not nobles, notables. What are the notables? The notables are those who are noticeable, no, you, that they are distinctive and they're high, that they are distinct and that they're noticeable, they are higher. The, no, the noble, uh, nobles are a word from the word kolos, which is the, also the word for beautiful and fine. So that's why the nobles are the beautiful ones. <laughs> the, the, the noble and, or beautiful ones, the kolos, the koloi. The many, uh, poloi, that's where we get the hoi, hoi poloi. Hoi poloi literally means the many. The many. Um, and the oloi, holoi, ho oloi, oloi means few. And the irony here is that always the, the aristoi, the aristoi, the best ones, Again, these are the conceptions of the dividing into group and status. Therefore, the best ones, the Aristoi, the Koloi, the, the best beautiful ones, the noble and beautiful ones. In fact, they have a word for this in Greek, the, uh, 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 um, the Agatha, no, no, what do you call it? The, the good and beautiful ones. Um, hoi Koloi Agathoi. Hoi Koloi Agathoi. The Koloi Agathoi. This is, we often translate this, texts often translate as gentlemen. The gentlemen. These are the, these are the people who are both good and noble or beautiful. The hoi koloi, the koloi agathoi. The good, the, the good and the beautiful. I prefer translating koloi as beautiful. You can translate as noble, fine noble, fine. Sometimes you can translate as good, but there's, in other words, it's, it's, it's to translate koloi as good would, would be misleading a little bit because we have agathos. Agathos is, which is typically what we call good. Now, um, why am I mentioning this? That then it's at four, 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 book four, chapter four, um, particularly these passage areas, this ninth paragraph area, he gives a wonderful division of the parts of the city, the parts of, a, uh, the parts of any political community. The farmers, those are concerned with sustenance. The working element, this is those who are, this is not, uh, this is the ones that is concerned with the arts, with, therefore these are the artisans, right? The working element, the artisans. The marketing element, by those which I mean, those who spend their time concerned with buying and selling, therefore trade and commerce, right? So that's the third, that, therefore the farmers, the, the people who provide sustenance, the working element, which is the uh, artisans, and then we have the marketing element. Then last, he mentions the laboring element. These are people who, who lack techne or art and only have their bodies to offer. The physical laborer. This is the fourth class. The fifth class, the warrior, 
He, and, and issues for not being slavish is uh, the question of autakos, in other words, self-sufficiency, autotaka. That means they're not being slavish. This is kind of here. This now sixth element of the city is kind of ignored because he he says the fifth and then, and then he says the seventh. He, in other words, he he doesn't speak of a sixth. He mentions the number of the the seventh. Um, he says that the element that performs public service by means of its property. The people who provide public, now public means not state service, it means shared service. Good does good for the whole city by their property. The well off. The next element are the, the, off, the magisterial, the magisterial that performs public services in respect to the offices, therefore the, the, off, the various people who deal with the offices. The next he then says, okay, the ninth element is that is deliberates, those, those, those offices that deliberate. These are simply the offices, those who deliver services to the city, public services to the city for the, on behalf of the, 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 the officers that deliver the necessary services the city needs. We would call this executive, right, or the administrative or executive agents. The next is the deliberative agent, the agent, the offices that deliberate decide and then last the adjudicative the element that judges concerning the just things for disputants now what's interesting if you then look at what happens in book seven chapter eight where he gives the similar account at least the sixfold account and it matches this the, it matches the four the, the at least up to the sixth element because it gives us the sixth element he goes what he goes he changes something as an important change, and that is this, that the sustenance, techne, arts, arms, is moved higher. Then what happens? The fourth one is uh, ready, uh, ready supplies of funds. I mean, the rich, right? The ones who have the money. Therefore, they, they have the money that they can provide the view both to the needs among themselves and the military needs, so they're well off. And then he goes, the superintendents of the divine, i.e. priests. And that's what's omitted. The priests are omitted. And then the most necessary of all, decision concerning things of vantage. So therefore, ironically, the deliberative element is there. So therefore, we have this interesting thing that the sixth element, which is omitted, is the, probably the priests. Which he, he will spend in book seven of the politics, a big account of time of the role of priests. And what are priests? Priests are there for, you have to understand the Greek conception. Religion is what holds a community together. Why? It's faith. What is the purpose of religion? It's piety. What is, or faithfulness would say. What is faithfulness? It's not belief. It's keeping your word, upholding your promises, doing what you say you promised, being faithful. And if you're not, if, if therefore, if someone breaks faith, they are faithless. Therefore, they cannot be trusted. In other words, faithfulness and trust are interconnected capacities. And societies, large societies, both small and large, rely on trust. And trust is rested on faithfulness, on piety in that sense. Therefore, we should understand religion not in terms of believing things, but rather keeping, uh, being faithful. That is, doing what you say you will do, keeping your promises. That's a different kind of, this is a totally different conception of piety, in the sense. The Christian conception of piety, in fact, this is the big difference between Jewish and Christian thinking, is that in Jewish thinking, it's... Uh, being a good Jew is only required to do what the law requires. You don't have to believe in God. There's no requirement of belief. You just have to obey the law. What is the law of the Torah? You just have to not eat pork, don't do anything. In other words, obey the rules. And if you don't obey the rules, then you're not a Jew. In other words, Judaism is understood in terms of action, in obedience, compliance with the law. Christianity is belief in the promise of the Savior. 
It, in other words, it's a change. And it's a change from the ancient to the modern. In other words, all modern conceptions of belief now is about my action of my will and the concept of belief. And faith now means my belief. Now, this is connected to the concept of faithfulness and trusting. There's being honest. It's not what replaces what replaces the older the um the older conception of faithfulness is now honesty. In other words, once faith becomes belief, then the question is: Is your belief true or not? And therefore, how do we know what true belief is? You're honest. And if you're not honest, that means you are false and you don't really believe. You pretend you believe. And this is the fundamental difference. The classics didn't really care about whether you believed or not. The classics only undercared if you complied by the law. Did you perform the right rituals? When, it were, when the day required you to do the rituals that required of the cult or your community group, the group that you belong to and the cult, the divine cult, did you go out and sacrifice? Did you obey the rules? If the answer is yes, then okay, you're a kosher. If you don't, I mean, I'm, I'm using a joke here, the Jewish ritual, the term kosher, referring to this in the, in, the, in, the, in the pagan sense. The pagan would understand that this rule, and therefore this is to understand why priests are so important in this world, in this conception. And that we have to understand the role of religion in that sense. Here is the classical, this is a restatement of this, this is the different groups. These are the kinds of people. Therefore, we get class instruction. There's two groups. We can divide the many and the few. The many and the notables. That's the first division between the notables, the few, or we would say, what, what is the word we'd say today? What, would, what, do, what, is, what is the concept that replaces the notables in our language? No, intelligence would be, the intelligentsia is, is an aspect of this group. Come on, what is the, other, what is the group, what would we call, what, what the Greeks or, and the, the ancient world would call the notables or that? What, would, what, what, what is the term we use instead today? Think of today's politics. What, what is the big divide in today's politics? In European politics and popular global politics today, if you look at the global scope, what is the big fight between? Come on. Are you that ignorant of your own environment? Come on. What is the big division? What is the big fight? Well, see, democracy is a problematic word. We'll say that. We'll say, oh, democracy. The fight of democracy. Okay, the fight between those we call democratic and those who we think are democratic and those we think are anti-democratic, right? Or, think we, 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 or we, we think of the good liberal democrat versus the anti-liberal, right? This is a big divide. But is that really the divide that's changing the nature of politics globally now, really? What is the two forces that are going on? It's economic. Globalism versus what? The national, local, uh, 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 traditional classes, usually farmers. Come on, the farmer? I, have, you, have you not seen the farmers out there screaming all through Europe about to rage a revolution? Why are they angry? Who are they upset about? Green Deal. Who wants the Green Deal? The European Union. Who runs the European Union? The elites. The modern word we use instead of the, the notables is the elites, the few, right? Those who are ruling, those who are in charge, those who have the power or controlling. The few and the many. And the problem here is the many are not one. The many are divided. 
The, uh, the first account as he goes, that the farming element, the work, marketing element, the working element, the first account, the second account, farming, craftsmen, merchants, laboring. And then we get into a larger account the, the, at, at 4 4. So that's the first account in four, uh, book four, chapter three, book six, chapter seven. Uh, 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 here is book four, chapter four, with the paragraphs, 21st paragraph. We get uh, six distinct elements. The farmers, as the, uh, the class. Those engaged in arts, the craftsmen. Buying and selling, the marketing element. The fourth, the sea element, which can be military, merchants, ferrying, fishing. The, 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 the sea element, which is interesting, the sh commercial. Is, every, is there always going to be a C element? Well, no. Yes and no. <laughs> is fishing a big industry? Yeah. Does it create an interest of working class people engaged in the, the uh, 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 transportation and uh, uh, fishing? Hence, why is there a big fight between the poor? Why did why is there a big debate about the port? The building of the new that the channel and the building of the new port. This is going to create different groups with different contenting interests, different sides of the people, the many, the workers who are involved in it. The menial element, these are the people who have no, no capital but only have their physical labor. No skill, no art, but only their physical bodies, laborers. And then last, the free element, this is the more interesting one. This is, uh, th that is not, in other words, this group is not descended from citizens um, and, and whatever uh, other similar kind of multitude there might be. So therefore there's other, other multitudes. But there he means the free element, those those who are kind of like yeah they're they have no they're just people who are descended but not necessarily they could be immigrants maybe we'd call them immigrants they're citizens now but they are not from citizens they're citizens but not of citizens so we maybe we would call that the immigrant now the notables this is more problematic the notables or the, the wealthy or the elites are divided usually by wealth family Virtue, quality, in other words, their, ex their character and their excellence. And then last, whatever else is said to be part of the city, right? That's the, that's the account in book, uh, book 4, chapter 3, and then book 4, chapter 4. It's again, notice this, wealth, good birth, virtue. And remember, virtue here is arete, which means character. The quality of character. People who's people remember what the virtues are. The classic virtues are what? The classic, the, you know, the four, the so-called four virtues. The four virtues are one is uh, courage, moderation, uh, uh, justice, and prudence, judgment. These are the kind of the, the, the high four. There's more. There's liberality. The Greeks would have many. The Greeks would have liberality. That means what? Spending of money? Being liberal is being able to, you know, it's, it's about being correct in the spending of money to others. The spending or not spending of money, of your money. Then the, there's magnificence, which deals with the, the, the spending of lots, big a lot of money aimed at the public, uh, aimed for the helping the benefit of the society. Magnificence. So someone who wants to spend a lot of money, their money, to help the public. Now we don't like that. Modern state society, state societies don't trust private individuals using their wealth to do things for the society. It views this as, oh, you're tampering with the system. In, in other words, that's the difference between a state society. You can, you know, I don't want to hear civil society. You're not a civil society. When PL types talk about civil society, <laughs> nonsense. That's a lie. They're talking out of their behinds. Why there's no civil society here? Do the rich, do the wealthy here build universities? They'll build it to make money, but do they build it to lose money, to, to give anything? 
Do the wealthy create public institutions? See, this is the funny thing. NGOs, not NGOs, but let's say social organizations or, or, or private associations in Europe tend to be either profit-driven or government-driven funded or tax-subsidized. Maybe industries will create things, but they will do so only for the interest of the industry in question, to advocate and push for the industry's interest and to make money. Do they actually create things? No. So a civil society is where the wealthiest classes act, use private their money, private money to do public goods, like the famous case of oh, what's his name? Um, oh, come on, Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie uh, made sure that every American uh, in the, in the, when he was alive, all the little towns in America, he gave them public libraries. Carnegie Institution, the institute he created to help fund and create institutions of, he created Carnegie, he created two or three, my God, even Rockefeller created a university, it's called University of Chicago. These men made universities. They endowed universities, even private state universities with large endowments of trust, like, my God, is Harvard poor? Does Harvard need even to take tuition at all to pay for operations in Harvard? No. You know how big the trust that the money trust that it has for Harvard? It's bigger than most countries' budgets. It's like 200. Like, I, I, I was it? I think it was like 120 billion dollars, maybe 200 billion dollars. The trust, the, the endowment of Harvard. It could basically pay for two. It could pay teachers and take no tuition at all and pay their faculty and keep the existing student rate and keep it alive for 200 years. That's how wealthy. That's, and in fact, the elite universities in America, this is not Europe. Private universities in po Europe, Poland particularly, are basically criminal organizations aimed at printing money. Like, like, si Collegium Civitas. Uh, uh, do, do they... They, they charge you to go there. Do they have scholarships for students? No. Everyone pays there. What it is, it's the association of the, the big professors who created it wanted to make, uh, attract students that will pay tuition and put money in their pocket. It's a business operation. Most American liberal, most American colleges are non-profit. There's a, there's a few prof, private prof, schools that are profit, but they're trade schools usually. Or business schools. Ninety percent of all American higher education is nonprofit. They make lots of money, but the money goes back into bombing trusts and, and employing people. Private Polish universities, state subsidized. My God, the Catholic universities. In America, who funds the Catholic universities? Who funds Notre Dame, Georgetown? All the big Catholic, you know, huge Catholic, Notre Dame, uh, uh, Villanova, who funds it? Well, the endowment, charities. The, uh, not to say the church may give some money, but not really. It's the Catholic alumni and local church Catholic communities would donate huge money, land, and things to church, and therefore their endowments are huge. Does the state give them money? Not directly. They give them money with student loans and things like that, or uh, 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 research grants, but not direct tax money to subsidize the operation of the students. I, I, I joke, Catholic universities here are not are state entities, not private entities, not church schools, really. So this is the fundamental difference about these things. So the elite, our elite, are don't have. In other words, this is the problem. State society does not like virtuous people exercising authority, exercising action to, the, to deliver the public good. See, a civil society is where private actors, private individuals are delivering public goods. 
schools. Most American schools are community-based. They're not state-based. They're not creatures of the state governments. They're creatures of the towns and cities, usually by the communities themselves, that eventually became state-controlled because of government regulation. The, as the regulatory entities started giving them money and assistance, therefore the state, the state government started to regulate and control, but their creation was always localized. Tocqueville would argue these are what we call associations. The local community would associate, create a school, they create the school districts. In other words, most local communities and these are bottoms up. So let's go look at the notables here. The notables here are the four, his characteristics. Um, education. The idea of elites, we used to get it, elites that they're higher, better educated, right? Good birth, what does that mean? That means you came from a good family. That your family can trace its several, trace its lines for seven, several generations. Usually that meant, by the way, aristocrats. Their family name is essential. They can trace their, they have land. They own land. The family has owned this piece of land for gen, multi-generations and have this. Now, by the way, this, ironically, what are the basis of the, fa the, fa the, the holders of capital are land, which land, which means not only land that you can grow food from, but also land that you can what risk generate resources from, or even rent out, right? Mental capacity, intellectual ability, physical capacity, the bodies, labor. So mental labor is twofold. There is intellectual labor and then there's physical labor, right? So labor. So capital, to, that was property, land, labor. The other one is trade, commerce. Cr uh, tr commerce. And then out of commerce comes what? Interest earning, money lending, speculation. Speculation is the most arbitrary and artificial of it. Can coins generate, can, do coins reproduce? <laughs> can a piece, can I put two pieces of money together and they're going to have sex and produce new babies? But doesn't that happen with interest? Artificial reproduction? Speculation? And here's the other scary thing. Oh, I have some today. I, my wife didn't take it this time. I have a hundred. By the way, what is this? Why is this hundred here? I mean, why is this really piece of, is this, is this piece of paper really worth a hundred? Zlotty? Its actual value is like, not even too grocery, I want a grocery property, right? But we, what, what, hold, what, what makes this worth a hundred zloty? Because the state says it. A powerful entity, the state, says that this is worth a hundred bucks. And we all, by the way, you all believe it too, belief. What happens when no one believes it's worth a hundred anymore? Because you don't believe it's worth 100, is it? In other words, because it's, it's inflation has happened, and that therefore things are so good. They, therefore, this doesn't buy the same amount of things that it bought, uh, let's say, two or three years ago. And now, let's say, what happens? It, it even gets worse. What happens? Do you believe it anymore? This is, a, this is an aspect of, you want to see a, 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 money and the nature of economy is about belief. A stock value, it's a belief entity. It's your, it's your, in other words, prices and selling. <laughs> it's that market prices, when you buy market entities, this is all a question of what is your willing, the, the price that, you're, you, that you believe it's worth and you're willing to pay. And therefore, these classes are very important in that sector. So therefore, let's look at this. 
The politeia gives has the material character, material element, right? It has a material element that gives the specific institutions and offices that it uses to shape the political order in a given community. There's four ways. And I'm, I'm using Aristotle's famous conception of co the four types of causation. Material cause. Matter. The material that formed the community. The institutions, the social structures, the people. The place, the location. This is the material the, the character of a regime. Does it matter that you're on? Does it matter that play, uh, Poland is on a plain and not in a mountain region? Does that shape the character, uh, shape the reality of your political life and the, the possibility of your population? The fact that you have a sea coast and rivers, and the okay, your rivers kind of suck. Uh, Polish river. Uh, what's who has better rivers, Germany or Poland? Germany, the Rhine, the uh, the Main. Their rivers are bigger, navigable, going through. Uh, they have more commerce in it. Do you, does, does your rivers have? In the 16th century, people used to risk it. But how much commerce is going up the Dan, going up the Danube versus going up the uh, uh, Vistula? Do you see big boats going up and down the Vistula, moving cargo and uh, uh, transportation of goods and services? Do you see the, therefore, does, is, uh, therefore you, in other words, because of the river, because of your rivers are a certain, the material category shapes the possibility of your politics. Geog this, is the, this is why uh, uh, Kaplan wrote a, uh, Robert Kaplan wrote a great book recently called Revenge of Geography. Why are countries poor and rich? Why did North America succeed and South America didn't? Trust me, what's the difference between the Nile? Try navigating the Nile and try navigating the Mississippi, and you'll see why the North America succeeded and South America didn't. Why is North, why is North Africa better than South Africa? The, look at the Nile and look at why the navigability of the upper Nile versus the complete disaster and the, the interior sources of the Nile. Second thing, the form. In other words, the, 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 the partea, the, the regime, shapes the specific form of different communities. Next one is the efficient, the effective character. This is the pudding clause. In other words, the, thing, the, things, that come, the things that come immediately before. This is like history or events or the, the backstory. In other words, the thing that preceded that just happened just before something happens. This is the efficient cause, effective character. The effective character of Potter, that is its ruling part, its polituma, which has the authority and reigns in the community. Its final or theological character of the Potter is that it provides the view of justice and right that each regime holds to be true and its members seek to aim. So every community has its conception of justice. What is right? What is wrong? And that what every community, every type of regime is going to have a, it advocates a certain type of re, view of justice. Democracy, what is the principle of democracy? Equality. What is the principle of oligarchy? That the wealth, the wealthy should rule. What is the principle of aristocracy? Most aristocrats, it's the virtuous should rule, or the good people should rule. What does that mean usually in practice? It means those of good birth, old wealth, education and wealth. Combined together, good birth, education, and wealth. This becomes the uh, therefore the old wealth should handle it, and good education. That's aristocratic. Okay. What is monarchy? Monarchy is the principle of either succession of my father, the rules of fathers, or the rule of the elder, the elder my fa the succession of father. That's the old. That's one conception. But also the concept of the kingly rule is the rule of the wise. The knowing over the unknowing. The, the, the one who knows versus the one who doesn't know. The wise versus the ignorant. It is the rule of the, therefore the claim of kingship is the claim of political expertise. 
By the way, is the is the claim of political expertise wild out here? Come on. That we should obey the science. <laughs> people say you should. We should listen to the science and trust the people who know. Therefore, isn't that the argument for kingship? That this, the one who know the you should follow the ones who know, and the ones who know should rule, and the ones who don't know should simply obey. That's kingship. This is the claim of kingship. So every regime's conception will tie, make a claim about its rule, about its justice of its rule, legitimization of its rule. Now back to the famous character the typology, right? The one, the kingship, you know, the one few, the many, the common advantage of the rule. Here's the, what we call the qualitative claim versus the quantitative claim. One few and many. The problem here is that the qualitative claim of what really defines democracy and oligarchy is not the, this quantitative claim, the few versus the many, but rather the, cl the claim that each regime makes. Okay, example of this. A society where there's many rich people ruling, what is that, democracy or an oligarchy? Or a regime where the poor, few poor are the ruling element. Is that a democracy or an oligarchy? The latter is a democracy and the former is an oligarchy. Money, few, because why? What defines democracy is the claim of equality, that the poor are ruling and no one should rule over anyone else. It's the rule of the demos. The demos are the, basically the people, the many, the, usually the workers, which are poor, the poorer. Where the wealthy rule, even that there are many, this is not democracy, this is the claim is wealth still. Now therefore, this is the problem. The, you know, book four, chapter three makes this question of why, how many regimes we'll have? Well, the number of varieties, the, the number of varieties of regime equals to the number of parts that compose the political community, the polis, the city, or polis, city, whatever term we want. We take the, we call polis, we use the Greek word polis, but we'll say political community. In other words, the number of varieties of regimes equals the total parts that compose any the, compose a city. So therefore, the variety of regimes are relative to the parts, the various parts and different classes and groups that can do it. Hence, Arist the famous account of defining principles. Aristocracy, uh, uh, this is the two accounts, 4448. Uh, uh, for, this is chapter, uh, paragraph 7, paragraph 9. Aristocracy is virtue, oligarchy is wealth, rule of the people, demo, pe freedom, uthulia. The second account needs it, uh, the first account of it is uthulia, wealth, virtue, then good birth. But good birth is being old wealth and virtue together, right? That's what, what, it, what it complies to. This gives us the account of the democracy regimes of book, set, uh, book, book uh, uh, four, the first account, the second account. In other words, he says the democracy, the different types of democracy. Democracies and oligarchies are going to have variations, sub-varieties. Why? Because different elements of the many are going to be a different authoritative. Here, the first democracy, in fact, the first account is this is an equality, this it's no, it's rich and poor are basically the same off. It's very similar to each other. This, this one, this account disappears. So therefore, the first account has five varieties. The second account later in that same paragraph, like this is book, book four, no, book four, chapter four, book four, chapter six, so different chapter, uh, gives the second account. Here is, oh my God, what happens here for democracy? Well, here is um, the, the uh, this is. That's the number of people equal to each other, the first story of democracy. The rich and poor are relatively the same, of same amount of money. There's not much different variation. Here, there's a property assessment. So the citizens, it's, 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 the assessment is low, but uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, therefore those who own property and therefore the, the value assessment of who can, be, who can vote would be very low, but you have to own some property. 
Next one is, well, only good citizens. All citizens do it. But you have to be a, you're, but you're, again, you have to be the son of a citizen. Uh, 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 and therefore, uh, but the laws rule. Here is another situation. Uh, all, in other words, all citizens of unquestioned descent. So therefore, if your parents are good citizens and you're, and that everyone knows you're, you're, gen, you're like two or three generations of family, okay, you, you've been a generation. Immigrants and other people, uh, people born of immigrant parents won't be able to vote. Here, any, anyone of any birth, uh, as long as they're a citizen, they can vote. The fifth one is, well, anyone can vote. <laughs> Everyone can vote. We don't care. And what happens here, this is where demagogues will arise. Pop, the Greek word demagogue means popular leaders who will flatter the people, become a monarch in this sense, and that this last kind of democracy is kind of like a tyranny. And he, this, he calls it the fourth kind of democracy here. It's referred to, therefore, and here is the fourth kind of democracy. In book six, it's the final sort of democracy. Again, the, final, the, 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 the fifth in the first account, the fourth in the second account, and the final in the book six account is the, the final, last fourth, the fourth and final is what? This is the, this is a democ this is the last democracy. And the last democracy is a, a uncontrolled many. The many are uncontrolled. It acts like a mob. It is violent and it's tyrannical. So here, this is a good regime to the bad regime. Here is oligarchs. My God, the oligarch characteristic, same thing. The first oligarchy is it's similar to this. The not the first. It's it's similar to the second the second oligarch and the, uh, the second democracy in the first account, where it's some uh, low. In other words. There is low estimates. In other words, all, the rich people, uh, the rich people, but the, the esti uh, you know, anyone who owns property, but the 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 est the uh, what do you call that the uh, the, uh, the assessment on who can be a citizen is low. So wealth is the criteria on here. Therefore, there's an overlap between this kind of democracy oligarchy and the second democracy in this. Uh, the, uh, uh, the first account, or the first democracy in the second, and the first democracy in the account of Book Six. So this is this is very interesting. Now, the first account, uh, 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 the second account of there's two accounts, one in Book Five, Channel Book Four, Chapter Five, and Book Four, Chapter Six. Book Four, Chapter C. Book Four, Chapter Four gives us the first five democracies. Book Four. Uh, uh, chapter five gives us the four types of oligarchies. Book four, chapter six gives us the gives is a restatement of everything, so it restates the variations, but it gives four and four. That's why there's a difference between the first account of democracy and the second account of democracy. And then book six gives us a uh, a full account of democracy for, in other words, four varieties of democracy, but not oligarchy. It gives a very incomplete account of oligarchy. So what happens to the second oligarchy? Well, these are larger assessments. So who can become a citizen becomes smaller and smaller. If who can be a, in a democracy, who can become a citizen is, in other words, it starts off kind of in a similar place, but democracies expand who can become citizens, but oligarchies constrain who become citizens. Um, this is the famous structure. I'm going to skip. This is the structure of book six about how it's structured. Notice it's so interesting. This book six is about creating regimes in that sense, the creating of regimes. He, Aristotle spends more time talking about democracies than oligarchies. What does that suggest to you? This is, this is all about establishing the regimes, book six is. So what, is it, what, what does that tell you in right there? Is he, is he pro, in other words, by looking at the text and how much time he spends on discussing establishing democracies versus establishing oligarchies, that suggests two, either two things. One, he's pro-democracy, or he thinks that in the new world, in the more complex world, only democracies are going to be more likely to compose. In other words, in other words, as society's gone this way, in other words, is he a Tocqueville or is he more de a pro-democrat? Tocqueville argues that oh, democracies, after a certain moment. 
No one, the only democracies will be tolerated. Therefore, we have to concern ourselves building democracies. So has history spoken and democracy is one, and therefore we have to focus on this and oligarchs are always going to be a last, a kind of a back, an accident that will be less complicated. Or is it that democracies are more difficult than oligarchies? Now here's the famous uh, account of kingship. I'm not going to go over that. There's four kind of kingships. We talk about kingships. These are accidental. You know, the, the, the kind of kingship is like this. But let's go, and I want to end here on today on this. And this is where we're going to. Uh, we have how much? We have 10, 15 minutes left or 10 minutes left? What? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. 11. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go for kingship. This is the famous concept of kingship. Kingship, kingship and tyranny, which is a very problematic problem, because what happens with tyranny, the last oligarchy is like the last democracy, that it will be tyrannical. What, what is the last uh, uh, aristocracy is? The fathers, the starting in group three, it becomes, the word actually becomes dynastic. Sometimes the translator will translate as powerful. I prefer the word dynastic. Leave the word dynastic means father. A dynastic situation is father follows, son follows from father. That's a dynasty, right? The child, the, in other words, in a dynastic oligarchy, who becomes the rulers? The rich, very, very few wealthy, but who now becomes, replaces them? Their sons. This is a dynastic oligarchy. Now here, the problem with dynastic oligarchy is that the fourth type of oligarchy is like that one, but the law no longer rules. It's the, in other words, in other words, what makes the what distinguishes the fourth democracy or the last democracy and the fourth oligarchy is that what the other oligarchies and the other democracies law restrains the rulers. The last democracy, the final democracy, be it either the fourth, fifth, or the the, uh, uh, the last, whatever the last democracy is. On the, in the fourth and final oligarchy, these are no longer, the rule does not constrain the rulers anymore, be they many or few. And they can do what they want, and whatever, whatever they change their mind, they can change their mind. It becomes tyrannical. So when the rulers say, I don't want, to, we're going to ignore all the laws that the other guys created. Okay. We, 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 we want the people, uh, we, don't, we don't care what the Constitution says, we want what the people demand. In other words, this is the last oligarchy, the last democracy. It's totalit- it, it is tyrannical, and it's like a tyranny. It could be a, a tyrant of one man, or a tyrant of many, or a tyrant of few. Who rules by, a tyrant always rules by his own will. He is not bound by law. He does what he wants. The tyrant is a beyond. That's, that, that, that could, any regime that does not obey the law. That, that's been, but that's what that's what tyranny meant originally. The tyrant is meant that you could be a good ruler. You could be a good tyrant because you, if you delivered, the, but you did. Your, in other words, you came into power, but, but without the law. In other words, you did not succeed the throne legally or lawfully. You're not, or you're not obeying the law, what the law says. And always, often remember, law is always connected. Or every, every laws and regimes, the laws and the regimes are always interconnected. Law is, in other words, law is always only a reflection of what justice is. And every regime's perception of justice manifests itself in law. So law is always relative to the regime type. So democratic law is going to be different from oligarchic law. And a good citizen in one regime is a bad citizen in another regime. The citizen, in other words, key concepts like citizenship will be defined by the type of regime. In other words, who is a citizen who is not is defined by the regime. And as remember, a citizen is one who shares in role. He's not a subject, he's a, he's a co-ruler. 
So therefore, this is the nature of the structure. Therefore, it's always tied. That's why this is, a, therefore, the tyrannical rule is simply lawless, or the laws don't matter. It's whatever we, the rulers, decide. What we want, what we will, what we desire, what we want, and we get what we want, because we will we use force, our power, to get it. Hence, kingship discussion is interesting because he says the Spartan kingship, which is kind of electoral generalship for life, the barbarians, which are kind of like tribal leaders and therefore like this, elective tyrannies, dictators, the third one, and the fourth one is heroic. This is the time of the kings of the like Iliad and Odyssey. These are heroic. Again, they're, and he says, notice something. Ah, you know, um, all of these are kind of the same. <laughs> <laughs> Here, the second account is the time of heroes, so the last become the first. Then the barbarians rule the master according to law, but derived from family. Um, the dictator, which is elective dictator, this elective kingships or elective tyranny. The Spartan, by the way, it's another, it's kind of permanent, a permanent general based on family, generalship for life. Uh, but last but not least is one person having authority over all matters. This is the word, this is the word would become um, one person who rules over a nation or a city, the arrangements of, all, he, he, this has one person ruling over all, this is a new type. In other words, these four collapse. In other words, what does, what does collapse here is the, the, okay, that's the fifth right here. That's why there's a typo here. Oops, fifth. Sorry, that should be a fifth. The fifth type here, the fifth here. The fifth here is that time of heroes, right? That time uh, becomes the Palm Basilea. But what happens in the third account, which in chapter 15, what happens? Well, all these things, the heroes, the heroic kingships, the barbarian kingships, the elective tyrannies, all collapse into the Spartan model. So what starts out as four becomes five with the induction of the Palm Basilea. But then what happens is the, the king over all and here is that you, it collapses into two, that all the other kingships are controlled by law. They don't, in other words, they, they're controlled either the Spartan, the general, the barbarian, the, even the dictator. By the way, dictators are always restrained by laws. The Roman word dictator does not mean a tyrant. Dictators are civic entities. They're exercising arbitrary power, but they do so, and they can ignore the law, but the law gives them that power. And they only have that power for emergency conditions. And that power will, in other words, his power is not permanent, it is restored to the, uh, uh, the legislative entity that gave it to them. So a dictator is not understood as a tyrant. We today, Think of a dictator. We think, oh, that's just the, this is just the guy who's who's anti-democratic. No, democracies and lawful regimes. The Roman model create the dictatorship was an office, a constitutional office, established for the protection and safety of the republic. Now it becomes a tool of abuse, which will destroy the republic, and we and does tend to destroy regimes that had it, right? It can be abused, but anything can be abused. Um, last but not least, in our last two minutes, let's look, look this is, I want to give you this model. This is the classic model. Democracies, how, how they change? They go downwards by ever increasing who's a, who's a citizen. Who can vote? Who has? Who can participate in the deliberative body? You can, in other words, in other words, you can have a large citizen. All the all the many citizens can be there, but not the first democracies, the early democracies, are not going to be. It's going to have. Let's say we're going to elect people to be uh, deliberators. We're not going to have everyone go together. In other words, having everyone go into the assembly like Athens. See, Athens is a fourth third or fourth style democracy. Why? You have to be rich. Poor societies can't afford to pay people to go and have lots of people pay to, to be deliberate and talk in the assembly. 
It was having all the citizens meet for six hours a day in order to deliberate what must be done. That's very expensive, wouldn't it? And paying everyone who can't afford to come? So pay the poor to show up? You see what the thing? If you, you, an oligarch can do the same thing, but, but to say, well, there's no pay. Sorry, no pay. So only people, the rich, only the rich can, who can afford to go would then go to the assembly and participate. But the democracy, how it does it, it, it gives the money that the poor can go to deliberate. So therefore, this ever increases the structure. Where oligarchy, what it does, it constrains it. Who participates becomes fewer and fewer and fewer. But the problem is the last democracy in the, the fourth oligarchy, the Nastic oligarchy, becomes what? Tyrannical. They're like, they are tyrannical or like a tyranny in that sense. They share the same character of tyranny, which is what? Lawlessness and despotic rule. What is despotic rule? In other words, the many or the few acting as a master, using coercion to get what it wants. This is why you can have, this is why the, the founding fathers and the early moderns worried about, the Montesquieu and you know, the Federalist Papers argued about majority tyranny, right? Even Tocqueville talks about it. Why is democracy dangerous? Why can it be tyrannical? Because without law restraining the many, the many will act what they want, and they will use coercion. The many will cr crush, easily crush the few, and therefore force them to do what they want. But what's more just, the many getting what they want or the few getting what they want? Ironically, the few preventing the many, that's as, un in other words, the many beating up the few is less bad than the few being up the many, but both are bad. Both are forms of injustice. Is it unjust for the many to deny the few their rights? Yes. Is it, uh, but it's worse that the few deny the many their rights. This is relative, this is the idea of relative relative conceptions of injustice. Both can be unjust, but one injustice is worse than the other. The minority oppressing a majority is always, uh, is more wrong than a majority oppressing a minority. It doesn't say that the majority, uh, you could, if they didn't oppress the majority, that would be right. So we'll stop here. We'll, uh, we'll stop here. We'll have the thing. Uh, see you next week. No, we won't. No, no, no meeting next week. Wait, wait. No meeting next week. We'll see you the week after, you guys.